Well, happy Mother's Day again. And this morning we're turning to the book of Esther. The book of Esther. Now, uh, it's kind of become my uh, custom, you might say, to preach each Mother's Day on one of the prominent women of the Bible. And this morning I've chosen to, uh, uh, really I'm storytelling this morning. I think of this as more as telling the story of Esther than actually preaching. But uh, I'll tell the story of Esther, and this is difficult for me. And I say it's difficult because it's usually difficult for me to narrow down uh, a, a sermon t- to more than just a few verses at a time. I don't remember preach uh, uh, from a whole chapter of the Bible at once. But this morning I'm going to try to tell the whole story of Esther, the entire nine chapter book in one sitting. So that's difficult. So as uh, Briscoe Darling of the old Andy Griffith series used to say, just grab a hold and hang on because uh, we're going to be moving a little quickly here. I might be talking as fast as Beverly. But we began this morning in chapter 1 with verse 1. I also forewarn you, I'm going to try to use the correct Jewish pronunciation for some of these names. So if I get a little tongue tied, you understand what's going on. Uh, now it came to pass in the days of Ahash Beirush. Uh, this was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days, uh, when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, uh, that in the third day of his reign he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes and the provinces came before him when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. And when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present at Shusan the citadel, from great to small in the court of the garden of the king's palace where uh, there were white and blue linen uh, curtains fastened with cords and fine linen purple on silver rods and uh, marble pillars and couches were gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster and turquoise and white and black marble and they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other with royal wine in abundance according to the generosity of the king and in accordance to, with the law. Drinking was compulsory, uh, not compulsory, for uh, so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that uh, they should do according to each man's pleasure. Queen Bashti had uh, also made a feast uh, for the women in the royal palace which be- belonged to King Ahash Beirush. Pray with me just a moment. Lord, we do uh, uh, thank you again for the women of the church. Lord, we're thankful for the obedience that these ladies have and the, uh, uh, the heart for God that they've expressed, Lord, for the influence that they've had on their families, for their children and their, uh, their grandchildren, Lord. We're grateful again for the moms that we've had and uh, the women that you put in our past that have been so influential in each of our lives. Uh, Lord, we celebrate Christian womanhood this morning, our womanhood, Lord, just... Uh, be with the women of the church, be with all the moms this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take you back for just a moment in history. Just a moment in history. About seven years prior to uh, the story of Esther, this was what was going on in the year 480 B.C. There was a massive Persian army who was making their way toward a little place called Athens in Greece. The Persians were a massive empire at that time. They were the biggest empire in all of the world. They had taken over the Babylonian Empire from a king we read about in the Bible named Nebuchadnezzar. Remember his story in the book of Daniel? They had taken over all of that. Now their their empire was the hugest empire that the world had ever known. But the problem was is they had some rebels in this little place called Athens, Greece, that were causing an uprising. They were rebelling against the Persian government. So the Persians were on their way to squash that rebellion. Now, eventually, they would lose that war. Eventually, they would lose. The Greek Empire would rise up and and take over the the Persian Empire under the direction of a man that history now calls Alexander the Great. Now, somebody was sitting there thinking, what on earth does any of that have to do with the book of Esther? Well, let let me explain to you that in the Greek language, the emperor of 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 the Persian Empire at that time went by the name Xerxes. In the Persian language, he was called uh, Kashar Arushar. 
But then when we come to the Hebrew language, the language of the Bible, his name was uh, Ahash Berush. The same man we're reading about here in the book of Esther was the same Persian emperor who would later lose the Persian Empire to the Greeks. But here in this story, he also has his heart conquered by a, a young Jewish orphan girl whose name is Esther. When the time came, this woman Esther used her influence over this very powerful man to save her people, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel from annihilation. At this point in the story, we need to understand that there were many Jewish people living within the Persian Empire. Uh, they had been in captivity in Babylon when the Persians took over, but now the Persians had control of them, and some of them were starting to return. We hear in the book of Nehemiah uh, to the city of Jerusalem. They were in the process of building the city walls, and the, the temple was being restored, but a lot of them were still living inside the Persian Empire. At that time, this king, Ahasuerus, he had called a meeting. He had called a, a, a summit, you might say, of all the, the powerful men in the empire. He called all the princes and the nobles together. And they had this long meeting that lasted six months, 180 days. What were they meeting about? Well, history tells us they were meeting to plan. They were planning the war that they were going to take, the final, uh, uh, the final invasion of, of Greece. So that's what was going on for six months. They were making battle plans, and then they come to the end of that six-month period, and this king, Ahasuerus, I'll get it right in a minute, he was so excited, so confident in the plans that they made, he called for a seven-day feast, a seven-day party for all the nobles and all the princes, and the, the women were having their own separate party under the queen's direction, this lady named Vashti. So on the seventh day of the party, the king, he calls for Vashti to present herself to the nobles, to the princes. He wanted to show her off. Scripture tells us she was a beautiful woman. He wanted to show her off to all of these nobles. So in verse 10, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, basically that means he was drunk. When he was drunk, he, he commanded Mahuman. Abithar, Harbuna, Abithar, Abagathar, Zathar, and Karkas, uh, seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king Ahash Berush to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty and to the, to the people and to the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. But Queen Vashti refused. She refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. Therefore, the king was furious, and his anger burned within him. So the king sends for the queen to come present herself. She refuses to do it. She says, I'm not going down there and showing off in front of all those drunken people. Now, he was angry about that. He thought, well, she's disobeyed me. She's embarrassed me in front of all of my friends, in front of all of these important people. He says, I've got to do something about this. So what did he do? could make up his own mind. He went to his, his advisors. His, his advisors were within his court. He said, what should I do about this thing? In verse 19, the advisor said, if it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out. Let a decree go out from him and let it, let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and of the Medes uh, so that it will not be altered that Vashti shall, not be, shall, not, uh, shall no more uh, before the, come before the king. Ahash uh, Beirush, and, and let the king uh, give his royal position uh, to another who is, is better than she. When the king's decree, which will make, uh, with, when the king's decree which he will make is proclaimed throughout all the empire, for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. And the reply pleased the king, and the princes and the king did according to the word of Mahukin. So this advisor tells him, look, what you need to do is this is replace, replace the queen. And I said, look, they were afraid. They were afraid that the women wasn't really boiled down to. They were afraid that uh, this uh, action by the queen would be heard about to all the other wives in the empire and that those women would rebel against their husband just as she had. And so they decided to make an example out of her. Basically, uh, the king threw out of the palace. He said, you're not going to be queen anymore. You're, gonna, you're, you're done. I'm going to replace you with somebody that I think is better than you are. So in verses 2 through 4 in chapter 2, then the king's servants 
uh, servants who had attended him said, uh, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in the provinces of his kingdom, uh, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins of Shushan to Shushan the citadel, that's a city, into the women's quarters under the custody of Hege, the king's eunuch, uh, custodian of the women, and let beautiful preparations uh, be given them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and so he did it. So his anger against Vashti kind of settled down, and his, uh, his uh, court uh, uh, people suggested to him that all of the young uh, pretty virgins within the empire be brought before him, and that he pick one of them out to be the next queen. Sure enough, there was one in that group that caught his attention, that he was really taken with, and Verse 5, chapter 2 in Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yair, the son of Shemi, the son of Kish, of Benjamite. And Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had uh, been captured with Yaonachah, Ye king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadashah, uh, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her in as his own daughter. So at this point we hear of two Jewish people that are brought into the story. One of them is a man named Mordecai, and one of them is this woman named Esther. Now technically they are cousins. Esther is the daughter of Mordecai's uncle, so therefore they're cousins. Mordecai is obviously here a bit older uh, than Esther is. He takes her into his home, and he, uh, uh, he, he raises her as his own daughter. Raises her as uh, his own daughter because her mother and father had died. She's uh, basically an orphan child that had been taken into Mordecai's house to be raised. Her name in the, uh, in the Greek or in the Hebrew was Hadashah, but when she became a, a Persian, they started calling her Esther, like they did with Daniel and, and some of the other children that were brought in out of the Jewish nation. They changed their name. Her name was now Esther. The scripture tells us she was a beautiful woman. A beautiful woman, and she was among that group of women who were gathered together to present uh, to the king as a potential new queen. In verse 8, so it was when the king's command and decree were heard and when many young women were gathered at Shishon, the city, uh, the citadel, under the custody of Hegei, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Hegei, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman pleased him and she obtained his favor. So he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of women. Esther had not revealed her people or her family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters uh, to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. So right, right off the bat, Esther... Uh, against the favor of the man who had been put in charge of all of these women, this Hege. He gives her very special treatment. She, she's supposed to get beauty treatments, as they said, uh, and she gets craning and court etiquette and all of these things, but he gives her special favor. He gives her even beyond the allowance of what she's supposed to get, and then he provides her with seven maidservants from the king's court, and he gives her the best place in the whole house to live in. So she's getting really special treatment from this man who has charge over all of these women that have been gathered together. Now, I think it's important for us to see there that nobody knew she was a Jew. Nobody in the castle, nobody in the, in the court, nobody in the king's palace, uh, nobody in the woman's house there, nobody knew that Esther was a Jew. Her background had been kept secret because Mordecai told her, don't tell anybody. All of these girls that were given a chance to be presented before the king. And then Esther's turn came. 
In verse 15, now when the turn came uh, for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, uh, the uncle of Mordecai, uh, who had taken her as daughter uh, to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Hagei, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in, seven, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all of the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of the king. I read all of that, and I think that's a pretty amazing story. Pretty amazing story. Here you have this young Jewish orphan girl who was herself among a nation that had been conquered, that had been exiled, that had been enslaved in Babylon, and all of a sudden this woman who comes out of that background is suddenly exalted to the highest position that any woman could have held in the world at that time. And I have to ask myself, how did that happen? How did that happen? All throughout the book of Esther, the name of God is never mentioned once. One of the few books of the Bible where you never hear the name of God. But what we have to understand about the book of Esther is that God is behind all of this. The power of the universe was behind this story. He was writing it with his own hand. He was orchestrating all these events. And it was by the power of God that Esther became the queen of the Persian Empire. After that, the story really starts to unfold. In verse 19, we hear that Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Mordecai. He was sitting there in the king's gate. Why was he doing that? Well, he had raised this young girl as daughter. He loved her. He really cared about her. He, he wanted to know what was going on. He had great concerns. So he kept hanging around. He kept hanging around the palace, hanging around the places where he, he thought he might get word of what was going on with Esther. It just happened that while he was sitting there that day, he heard, a, he heard a two men talking. Two men were talking with each other, and he overheard their conversation, and what they were doing was they were plotting. They were plotting an assassination against the king, Ahash Berush. Now when Mordecai heard that, uh, he told Esther, made sure that she got word of that, and then Esther went to the king and told him what Mordecai had said. Now the king inquired about it. He had this big inquiry going on. These two men were found out to be guilty uh, of trying to assassinate the king, and they were both hanged. At that point, we hear in verse 23 of that chapter, it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. So all of that was recorded. All of that business of the assassination attempt and Mordecai's part in it was recorded in the official record books of the Persians. Now, that didn't happen for just any reason. That didn't happen by chance. Again, God was behind that. And we'll see in a minute just how all of that plays into this story. We got to chapter 3. We meet another man. He's a Persian man. His name is Haman. We often call him in English Haman, and that's okay, but as I understand it, the correct Hebrew pronunciation is Haman. But in verse 1 of chapter 3, after these things, King Ahash Berush promoted Haman, the son of Hamamada, uh, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above the princes who were, who were with him. So the king takes this man, Haman, he sees something in him, I guess he must have some... Uh, uh, some leadership abilities, and the king takes this man, he raises him up to be second in command of the empire. He's basically the king's right-hand man. The problem with that is this man, Haman, he hated Jews. He hated them. He had a bitterness in his heart against the whole Jewish nation. Now, why was that so? Why did he hate the Jews so much? Well, the key uh, to unraveling that is found in the fact that he was an Agagite. It says that several times in the story, and the reason that's said several times is because we need to understand why he hates the Jews. 
If you understand Jewish history, you know uh, that during the early days of, of the, the Jewish nation, they had a constant running battle with a group of people called the Amalekites. The Amalekites, we hear about them in several books of Scripture. The Amalekites, they were always fighting with the Amalekites. And when Saul became the first king of the nation of Israel, Saul and the armies of Israel conquered the Amalekites. And when they did, they took king, the king of the Amalekites prisoner. His name was Agog. Agog. And God had told Saul to kill Agog to make sure the man did not live. That was God's command, but Saul didn't do it. He didn't do it. He didn't kill Agog. God was furious about that. So the prophet Samuel came into that story. God sent Samuel. Samuel went there. He picked up a sword. And chapter 15 of 1 Samuel says he took the sword and he cut Agog into little bitty pieces. Because that's what God had told him to do. And what we learn here is that this man Ammon was a direct descendant of King Agog. He was an Agagite. So he was a descendant of this ancient king, and he was still holding a grudge in his heart against the Jewish people for what they had done to his ancestor. So he didn't like the Jews very much. In fact, he hated them. Specifically, he aimed all of that hatred at one Jew, Mordecai. Mordecai. You see... Mordecai remembered that ancient story about the, the Jews and the Amalekites just as well as Haman did, or Haman, uh, Haman. And, and he, he refused to bow down to Haman as a ruler. Haman didn't like that. He didn't like it because Mordecai would not bow down to him. In chapter 3, verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow and pay homage to him, Haman was filled with wrath. But it's the same to lay hands on Mordecai alone. He disdained that, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all of the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahash Verush, the people of Mordecai. So Haman made up his mind, I'm just going to be done with these Jews. I'm going to make sure they all get wiped out. What did he do? He went to the wise men. He went to the magicians. He went to the same ones who were the ancestors of the wise men who were there at Jesus' birth. He went to those guys and he said, tell me, which is the best day? Give me the exact pinpoint, the exact day that would be the best day to wipe all the Jews off the face of the planet. And they did. They did what they called a poor. A poor. They cast lots. They called that poor. Cast the lots, and they chose a day, and they said, Amon, this is the best day in the calendar year for all the Jews to be, waste, uh, to, to be wiped off the face of the earth. So he goes to the king, and he convinces the king that the Jews are a threat against his throne. And he also tells the king, we need to wipe out these Jews on this day that the wise men have chosen. He says, if we do that, then we can take control of all of the land that they now possess, and we can take all of the wealth that they have accumulated, and we can roll that over into the royal treasury. Sounds kind of like government today, doesn't it? Roll everything, it's all about money. Roll it over into the treasury, and the king liked that idea, so he signed the decree. He signed the decree, and Ammon made sure that decree went out to all the provinces. In verse 13, the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. I think it's only fair to tell you that Satan was behind all of this. Satan was behind every drop of it. That was Satan's plan all, all through the Old Testament Scriptures. He wanted to destroy the nation of Israel. He wanted to destroy the Jews. You see, Satan knew. He knew that the promised Messiah, he knew that the Savior of the world was to be born out of the Jewish nation. So he, he had it figured out in his mind, if I could just wipe out the Jews... Uh, no Jews, no Jesus, right? That was Satan's plan. So he continued throughout all Scripture to destroy the Jews in the Old Testament, and this is just one example. 
Now, how did Mordecai, how did the Jews respond uh, to all that was going on here? Well, in chapter 4, verse 1, Mordecai learned uh, all that had happened, and he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes, and he went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter, bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, uh, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and wailing. And, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. They were in a state of mourning. They were crying bitterly. They were weeping, crying out. It says there they fasted. We learned how uh, a few weeks ago that in biblical times uh, that fasting always occurred during times of great need. And these people were in great need. They were in need of the protection that God had promised them. So they were fasting. What they didn't understand is that God was working ahead of them. God already had a plan. His plan was already in place. While Satan was making a plan to destroy the Jews, God had already been making a plan to save the Jews. And the name of his plan was Esther. This woman, this lady named Esther. Mordecai made sure a word of all of this came to Esther. And, and, and Esther was willing to help. In fact, he made sure that she had a copy of the decree in her hand uh, to read Mordecai's, Mordecai's solution to the problem was simple. He thought all Esther has to do is go before the king and, and, and plead with the king to save the Jews' life. That sounded simple to Mordecai. It sounds simple to us, but in the days of the Persian Empire, that wasn't so simple because to present yourself before the king without an invitation was death. That was the law. He came before the king without an invitation from the king. That was instant death. That, that, that was the law of the land. Uh, Esther didn't have an invitation. She hadn't been invited to go before the king in some 30 days. She said, I don't know how I'm going to do this. How am I going to get in front of the king? So she sent word back to Mordecai about the problem and asked, what should I do? What did Mordecai say? Verse 13, he said, he told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than any of the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from some other place, uh, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows whether you have come to the, to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai basically tells her, uh, you're between a rock and a hard place. If you go before the king, there's a good chance you're going to die. If you keep silent, they're eventually going to find out that you're a Jew, and just like all the other Jews, you're going to die. He says, now, we don't have to worry about the nation of Israel. Mordecai had great faith. He said, God's going to deliver Israel out of this in some form, fashion, or way, whether you do anything, Esther, or not. He said, but if you don't, a lot of people are going to die, yourself and your family. A lot of Jews are going to die. The nation of Israel, a remnant, will be saved, but... He says, who knows, Esther, maybe God put you in this place that you're in right now for just such a time as this. How did Esther respond to Mordecai? In verse 15, Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way, and he did according to all that Esther had commanded him. She bravely, Esther bravely accepted the role in this story that God had written for her. I want you to think just about how brave this woman is. She knew that if she went before the king, which was against the law, there was a good chance she was going to die. She also knew that if she kept silent, she might extend her life a little bit, but a lot of her people were going to die. She could, have, she could have kept the secret. She could have extended her life. She could have not told anyone that she was a Jew and just sat back and watched the Jewish people be killed. But she didn't. She decided to risk her life and go before the king in hopes of saving her people. All she asked of Mordecai was that he gathered together all of the Jews of the city of Shushan and that they fast for her and that they pray for her that she be protected when she went before the king. 
Now we come to chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across uh, from the king's house while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw uh, Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter and the king said to her, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half of the kingdom. So Esther makes her uninvited appearance there before, uh, before the king. And the king, when he saw her, he was so enamored with her beauty. He was so enthralled with her mere presence in his courtroom, in his, in his throne room, that he threw all the rules, all the etiquette about having to have an invitation and all that. He threw all of that right out the window, and he called her up and said, Esther, I'll give you anything you want up to half the empire, half of the whole, uh, 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 a whole Persian empire. He said, I'll give you whatever you would like. She didn't want any part of that. She didn't want any part of the kingdom. All she wanted was for her people to live. This, this king, this hard-natured, self-serving king, melted like butter in the presence of this woman that God had sent before him. So what did she ask of the king? She took a roundabout course. I think God was actually leading her. Maybe the Holy Spirit within her leading her as to how to address this. Did she go straight to the problem and, and address it to the king? No. Uh, she asked the king if she could have a banquet. She said, I want to have a little party and I want to invite you and I want to invite this other guy named Naman. You three, y'all come over to my house. We're going to have a party. In verse 4, so King uh, Esther answered the king, If it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come today to a banquet that I have prepared for, the, for him. Uh, then the king said, Bring Haman quickly that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman, they went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And when they got to the banquet, again, God's directing Esther, and he's taking her on a roundabout course as to how to handle this problem. When they get to the banquet, the king again asks Esther, is there something I can do for you? What is it that you want? Again, instead of directly addressing the problem, she says, you know, I'm enjoying this so much. Let's do this again tomorrow. Let's have another party. Let's have another little banquet, just you and me and Amon. Let's, let's get together and do this again tomorrow. Now, Amon, he left that party feeling pretty smug about himself. He left that party, that banquet, feeling pretty good. I mean, he'd been invited as the only guest to a royal banquet, so he was, he was riding pretty high. But then he ran into Mordecai again. And he got all upset because Mordecai again refused to bow down to him. Now again, he, he restrained himself, but he went back home and he started bragging to all of his family about the banquet that he'd been invited to and how he'd been honored by both the king and the queen and how good everything was going. And then he told his wife about Mordecai. He told his wife about Mordecai and his wife suggested uh, to Haman, you, ought, you, ought to, you need to get rid of that guy, just get him out of the way. She said, you need to have him killed. Now, Haman, he liked that idea. So that night, he ordered that a gallows should be built in the night so that he could go before the king and request that Mordecai be killed, be executed the very next morning. Now, Haman, he went to sleep that night. He went to sleep that night feeling pretty good about himself. Went to sleep feeling pretty good uh, about all that was going on. But King Harash, uh, Ahash Behrush, uh, he couldn't sleep at all that night. He couldn't sleep except for some reason he could not go to sleep. So what did he do? He called for the royal record books. He called for the royal record books and, you know, some people when they can't sleep, they drink milk, have warm milk. Some people count cheap. I, I don't know this guy, I guess when he couldn't sleep, he just called for the record books and thought maybe by reading through the books it would make him sleepy. I don't know, but for whatever reason, he received a book, and it just happened, uh, by the grace of God, uh, to be the very record book that recorded the story of how Mordecai had saved the king from being assassinated a few years earlier. The king read all of that and says, you know, I, I remember Mordecai never received any kind of reward for that. 
No kind of reward at all. So while, while Haman uh, was asleep that night planning on how he was going to execute Mordecai in the morning, the king was laying in his bed trying to figure out how he was going to reward Mordecai in the morning. Now Haman shows up at the king's palace uh, the very next morning with the intent that he's going to ask the king if he can have uh, uh, this man Mordecai executed. But before he can get those words out of his mouth, uh, uh, the king asked ask Haman a question. Verse 6 of Esther 6, uh, Haman came in and the king asked him, What shall be done for a man whom the king delights to honor? King asked Haman, what, what can I do to the light of man that I really want to honor? Now, Haman, in his uh, egotistical manner, he thought the king was talking about him. I mean, he'd already been invited to two royal banquets. I mean, who, who could be more delightful than the king than he was? We thought all of this was about honoring himself. He thought it was a rhetorical question. So he, he answered and he said, you know, if I knew a man I wanted to honor like that, this is what I'd do for him. I'd put him in the king's robes. Uh, and I'd put him on one of the king's horses, and then I'd have one of the highest princes in the land parade that man all through town so all the people could see just how much uh, the king honors him. Now the king liked that suggestion. He says, okay, Haman, you do that. You do that. You go out, you find Mordecai, and you put him in the king's robes, put him on a kingly horse, and you parade him through town so all the people can see how much I honor Mordecai. All of this blew up on Haman. He thought it was all about him. It was a disgrace for him. He had to take his enemy and lead him. He had to lead the parade for this man to town. He went back to his house that evening in disgrace. But that night, he went back to Queen Esther's second banquet. And it was there that he would receive yet another surprise. When they got there, the king again asked Esther, What is it that you would like? And this time she let the hammer drop. Chapter 7, verse 3, Queen Esther answered him and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, uh, to be destroyed, to be killed, uh, to be annihilated. Had we been sold as a male or female slaves, I, I would have held my tongue although the enemy would, uh, could never compensate for the king's loss. So the king, Ahash Berush, answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And the queen Esther said, The adversary, the enemy, is this wicked man, Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The noose was tightening around Haman's neck while he was sitting there at the banquet table. He had no idea that Esther was one of the very Jews that he had been trying to annihilate, trying to kill. He was scared to death. Scared to death. He, he starts begging before the queen for his life. The king is so angry he leaves the banquet and he goes and he hangs out in the garden a while to hang out But he finally comes back. He finally comes back in verse 7. When the king arose in his wrath uh, from the banquet of wine, and he went into the palace garden, uh, but Haman stood before the queen Esther and pleaded for his life, and he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. The king comes back, and what does he do? He has Haman led away. And Haman is hanged along with all of his sons, on the very scaffold, the, the gallows that he had, had built for hanging Mordecai. Hung him on the same scaffold that he had built himself. Now you'd think that'd be the end of the story, but there's still a problem here. You see, the king had made a decree that the Jews would die. And by, uh, by Persian law, when the king made a decree, it could not be reversed. Couldn't be reversed. That law was still in place. So, so what did he do? What did he do? Well, first of all, he took everything that belonged to Haman and he gave it to Esther. He gave it to Esther, and she in turn turned around. She gave it to Mordecai, and then the king exalted Mordecai and put him in Haman's place. Mordecai became the second in command of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the Persian Empire. 
So how did they handle the problem? Well, the problem, they handled that by writing a second decree. In Esther 9, verse 1, now in the twelfth month, it, that is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. On that day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, the opposite occurred, and that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. You see, they handled the problem by making sure that the Jewish people were armed and ready whenever the Persians attacked them. When the Persians came to destroy the Jewish nation, the Jewish people had been backed up by the king and by Mordecai, and they were armed to the teeth. And history tells us a battle took place in which 75,000 Persians died. The Jews who were supposed to be annihilated turned it all around. And it was the Persians who were annihilated instead. History tells us the exact date when this thing happened, March 7th. The year 473 B.C. The Jews have been celebrating that day ever since. Ever since. It's still on your calendar today. I guarantee you, if you're looking at a calendar, you'll see the date printed on there as a Jewish holiday. In Esther 9, verse 27, the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them that without fail they should celebrate these two days every year according to the written instructions and according to the prescribed times. That these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city. That these days of Purim, Purim, should not fail to be observed among the Jews. And that the memory of them should not perish from among the descendants uh, of the nation of Israel. Every year the Jews celebrate a day they call uh, Purim. Purim. Remember what I told you about the casting of lots? What was it called? Pur. They celebrate the day in which the lot was cast. That's why they name it this holiday. If you look at your calendars in the month of March, you'll usually find it there somewhere. On that day, they celebrate the day that God used an orphan Jewish woman to change the history of the course of the world. And that's what she did. Understand, she, she saved the Jewish nation from annihilation. In doing that, she also, uh, she also played a part in the redemption history of all of us. Those of us who were saved by Jesus Christ who were born from the Jews. So the Jews were celebrating the influence that this woman had over her people. How, that, how they, she had this influence that changed the course of human history. She, she uh, did what she did for the glory of God. And she did what she did to help her people Israel. Now I thought about that in relation to Mother's Day. And truly what we're doing this morning is the same thing. We're doing the same thing this morning as we celebrate mothers. We're celebrating the women that God has put in our lives that influenced us, that washed over us, that lead us, the God that made sure we were protected. We're, we're, we're celebrating the same kind of celebration that you celebrate for Esther. We celebrate this morning the women that God has used to influence us as individuals, and we celebrate the women that God has used to influence the church. We celebrate this morning all moms and all of the women of Midland Baptist Church. And that's where I'm going to end this morning. That's the story of Esther. I hope you've enjoyed it. And again, I'll end this morning by saying Happy Mother's Day. Bless all you moms, and bless all the ladies of our church. And with that, I'll ask Sister Faye, she'll come up and we'll have our closing song. God is so good. Number 23, a good song to end on this morning. God is good. He's good this day and every day. Let's stand and sing this as we close this morning.
God regarding the good. I encourage each of you to remember your mom today. I know a lot of us in this building, our moms have passed on. Some of you still have moms that are living. And I certainly hope you'll honor your mom today. Um, I'll stand before you and say I'm grateful for the mother that God gave me. And I'm also grateful for the grandmothers. I, I was blessed to be born to a young mother, so I got to know not only my mom, but my grandmothers on both sides of the family. And they were all godly women who went with my life greatly. Um, I'm also grateful for all the women of the church over the years that God has put before me and the influence that they've had in my life, the influence that they've had in the church. Uh, we, we certainly want to honor all women this morning, all the women of God, not just the, not just the moms, but even the, uh, the women, uh, just, just of all, all of the, the moms and the women that have given their life to Christ. But if you will, let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord, we do ask you to bless the moms in our church, Lord, that you'll bless all the mothers who still have children uh, that they influence, Lord, that you'll uh, continue to bless them with uh, uh, the power to influence their children for the, for the glory of God and for the good of the people that are around those women, Lord. We, we are thankful for the women of the church.